Yeah. Perfect. That's the kind of energy I like to see. So I'm assuming everybody's in the room because you're all building theme parks and you want to know how to make them go really fast, right? So before I get into that, uh, just a little bit about myself. My name is Mike. I live in Perth, Western Australia, uh, where I work from home for a company called Particular Software. Just a quick show of hands. Who in the audience has actually heard of Particular Software? We're the makers of in-service bus. Um, but that's not what I'm here to talk to you guys about today. Um, I want to talk about a system that I worked on long before I joined Particular. It was actually one of the very first systems where I was primarily responsible for the architecture and for getting it into production. And because I was young and I didn't know anything, it was an N-tier kind of system where uh, N was equal to 3, because that was the magic number of the time. We sort of had a, a web tier, an application tier, and a database tier, because that's what everyone said you should be doing, and they're all installed on different servers. And we worked on this thing for months. And we finally had a version that we thought, this is the version. This is perfect. It's passed all of our QA tests. It's ready for production. So we came in on a weekend, on a Sunday. It was actually a long weekend, just in case something went wrong. We came in on a Sunday, and we installed all of the pieces, and we connected and configured everything and made everything work. And we smoke tested it and proved that it was all good. And we had a celebratory drink, and we went home. And the next day, everything was fine. It was better than fine. The business was ludicrously happy. Right, which is weird, because that doesn't happen. Uh, but they had this new system, and they were able to do the same jobs that they were doing before, but now with a shiny new system, uh, which in theory was faster and better. And for whatever reason, th this was what they had asked for, and it was working the way that they were hoping that it would work. Uh, so everybody was happy. And we got lots of congratulations. We were wandering around the floor, sort of helping customers and stuff. And then we went back to business as usual. But we were still sort of riding that high for a while. Uh, until we were working on the next version, and the phone rang. We picked up the phone. Yeah, uh, the application's not working. I can't do my job. Like, oh, sorry. We'll look into that. Hang up the phone. Turn around to look at the computer, and the phone rings again. Pick up the phone. Yeah? Yeah, the application's not working. Uh, I can't do my job. Like, yeah, we know. We're looking into it. Put down the phone. Turn around. The phone rings again, right? This keeps happening over and over and over again. The business is standing over us, looking over our shoulders, because they're stuck. They can't do anything. Everything's broken. And after a bit of investigation in between phone calls, uh, we found out that the database server had stopped responding. And the reason was another application had been installed on that database server, and it had eaten all the hard drive space. And SQL Server had gone, ah, I can't write anything down, so I'm not going to talk to anyone. And it just sort of closed doors. And in an N-tier application, what happens when one tier goes down is that the next tier stops functioning as well because it needs the previous tier to do its job, and so on and so forth all the way up the stack. So this whole thing was just broken. We managed to fix it. We got that other application out. We said, get your own database server. Um, and we, uh, we got the system back up and running. And everyone went home kind of tired. And the next day, I got called into the boss's office, which is never a good sign. Uh, but she was nice, so it was fine. And she said, uh, look, the business is happy that we managed to get over this outage fairly quickly. Got over it in an hour or so, and uh, that was good. Um, but I would like to make sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen again. So how do we do that? And the ops guy that was in the room said, well, we've installed some disk space monitoring stuff on all of our tools to make sure that we don't run out of disk space again, which was good. Uh, and me being paranoid, I wrote a little script that would basically just ping each of the tiers every 30 seconds or so and send me a message when one of them stopped responding. And everything was great, because the next time that the phone rang and the customers were calling us to say that the application was down, we were able to say, yes, we know, we're looking into it, we know what it is, and we'll have a fix in place in 15 minutes, go for a coffee. And this, kept, this happened a few times. So every time there was an outage, by the time the business got to us and told us that there was a problem, we had already sort of known about it and were looking into it. And the business came to trust that we, were, we had their back, that we were making sure that their systems were up and running when they needed to use them, which is why it took so long to find out about the next problem. I found out about this problem because I was having lunch. And I was having lunch with a member of the business who was uh, just sitting there eating. And I sort of finished eating and said, all right, I've got to go back to work now. And he said something really innocuous. He said, I can't go back to work right now. Uh, I can't enter new users after lunchtime. Like, I made it all the way to the door and then turned around and went, wait a minute. <laughs> I wrote that screen. Why can't you do that? 
said, I don't know, it just doesn't work. They, they just don't get recorded. The customers don't get recorded, I have to re-input the data. What? That's a weird thing, that was never in the requirements. <laughs> I don't remember putting that there. Why is the system behaving this way? So we went and we had a look, and uh, sure enough, when we entered customer details, it just didn't work. And um, we went and had a look in the log files and we saw that there was an exception being thrown. See, the thing about an N-tier application is these days we'd call it a monolith. It doesn't look like a monolith because it's got multiple bits. But all the bits have to be on and working at the same time. So it's kind of just one big thing that we happen to have installed on a number of machines. And it turns out that the monolith that we had built was bigger than we thought it was because it had even more parts to it that aren't represented in this diagram. And in this case, it was an email server, an SMTP server. See, what was happening is when you create a new client record, we send a welcome email. And if the SMTP server is down when you send that email, it throws an exception. That sucks. So why is this thing down after lunch every day? Because somebody installed some terrible, terrible virus scanner software that brought the server to its knees and stopped it from responding to requests. This is an example of a thing called temporal coupling. Right? This is a case where you need a job to be, uh, to be done, some business work to be done, and it's spread across two different things, and both of those things have to be up and running at the exact same moment, because if they're not, the job won't get done. So we went back and did some reading about that, and uh, it turns out that the easiest way to kind of fix this problem is to stick something in the middle. So rather than doing the work immediately, you write down the work and you put it somewhere. In this case, we put it in a persistent queue. I think in this case it was MSMQ, but it could be RabbitMQ or Azure Service Bus or any of those sort of queuing technologies. Now what happens is when we create a brand new customer, rather than sending an email directly, we write down the details of the email that we want to send and we put it in a queue. And then someone later on, someone else will come along and read that message out of the queue and send it to the SMTP server. And that means that if our server is busy virus scanning and doing whatever it is that it's doing, when it fails, that failure is isolated to that side of the queue. So everything on the other side of the queue is just going to continue functioning as per normal, which means now that guy doesn't get long lunch breaks. And of course, we wanted to monitor that thing as well because sometimes it does go down. We need to watch it. But this is not the only kind of problem that the business didn't really tell us about. There were other things that, were, that had temporal coupling involved in them as well, and we sort of found them over time. So there were things like credit card payments, PDF generation, any kind of third-party web service call where we were reaching out to something external where that thing external needed to have needed to be up at the same time, that was a case of temporal coupling. We could break each one of those cases by introducing a queue. And over time, we even got rid of the application server altogether. We basically, anytime we wanted any work to be done, we started writing it down, sticking it in a queue somewhere, and there'd be some process that goes in and pulls that off the queue later on. And this is starting to look a bit more like what we would call sort of a microservices, a distributed architecture system today. Which was great. It took us years to get to this point, by the way. It took us a really long time. But I got called into the boss's office again. And by this stage, it's, it's happened a few times that I don't feel so bad about it. She says, the business is working really, really well. They're really happy with the system. But the word around the lunchroom is it's kind of slow. Application is kind of slow. How about we spend some cycles like investing in improving the performance of this system that we've built in the same way that we kind of look at errors when they happen and we fix them immediately, let's proactively look at like, the performance and try and fix it before anything serious comes up. And I asked, well, are there any particular use cases that are slow? Said, no, it's just generally slow. Great. She said, we're going to put some time in the next iteration to improve the performance of this system. Where do we start? And I thought about our collection of distributed components and how they're working, and everything's kind of doing its job as fast as it can. And I said, in order to answer that question, I need you to send me to Disneyland. Now, to her credit, she very quickly arrived at the obvious question, which is, how the heck does that work? How is sending you to Disneyland going to help us improve the performance of the distributed system? And I grabbed the nearest whiteboard, and I started writing things down. I said, look, in our system, we have a bunch of components. Each of those components is processing work as fast as they possibly can. And in front of each one, there is a queue that represents a backlog of work for that component. 
and it's trying to get through that backlog as fast as it can. So when I go to Disneyland, I will see a collection of attractions. These are things that people go on and ride. And those things are processing customers as quickly as they possibly can. And in front of each one, there is a queue. There's a backlog of work for that attraction to try and get through. And if anybody has figured out how to optimize the performance of distributed systems, it's going to be Disneyland, because they have way more money than we do. Now, at this point, like I said, in the project, we've been doing this for years. And uh, I had gotten married and had kids and got a mortgage and bought a dog and was studying. And I must have looked exhausted <laughs> or crazy, because it worked. <laughs> and I made it to Disneyland. Hands up, who's been to Disneyland? Wow, that's a fair number of people, considering how far away it is from here. Did they say that Disneyland is the most magical place on Earth, but what they don't tell you is that they've taken your childhood and they've put it in a bowl and put in cereal like milk, and then they sat you in front of a video screen showing your childhood like it's Saturday morning cartoons. It doesn't matter what your rational part of your brain thinks. You know that that is not Mickey Mouse. That's an idiot in a suit. It doesn't matter. That's Mickey Mouse. Right? As soon as you get to meet Mickey Mouse, like I was five seconds into the park, I'm like, ah, there's Chip and Dale. <laughs> it's amazing. But I kind of got lost in it for a little while, probably a day or so. And then sometime around uh, having breakfast with Rafiki from The Lion King, I went back through my photos to try and find this exact moment. And I think it's here. Because I think this is the exact moment that I realized I have to go back to work on Monday. And I have to justify this. <laughs> So I really, really need to learn something about the, the performance of distributed systems while I'm here in Disneyland. So we can't start by trying to understand the performance of an entire theme park. It's too big. And we're engineers. And what do engineers do? We take big problems, we make smaller problems out of them, we solve the smaller problems, and then scale those solutions up to the bigger problem. So let's start by trying to understand the performance of a single attraction at Disneyland. We're going to do that by trying to measure throughput. Right, throughput is a measure of how many customers get to ride an attraction in a given period of time. Uh, it sounds pretty good, right? Because we want to get a lot of customers through our system. That's what we're aiming for. So how do we measure throughput? It's easy. You need two things. You need a stopwatch in one hand. In the other hand, you need a tally ticker. And you stand at the back of the attraction, and you start your stopwatch, and you run it for like an hour. And during that time, everybody that comes off the attraction you push the tally ticker so you count them. And at the end of the hour, you just write down whatever came up in the tally ticker, and then reset both and go again. And if you do that for a day, um, if the Disney people don't kick you off, <laughs> if you stand there for a day, you end up with a graph that looks something like this. right? So you can actually measure throughput over the course of the day. Now, it doesn't help if you're looking at performance data to look at just one thing. So I wanted to measure a second one to try and compare them, to see if I could see which one I thought was going better. So there, there's a second one that I measured. Now, quick audience test. Performance-wise, who thinks the blue attraction is doing better than the orange one? Couple of hands. Who thinks the orange one is doing better than the blue one? A few more hands. Who thinks this is a trick question? Good, everyone's awake. Uh, see, these uh, theme park attractions are very finely tuned machines. Their performance doesn't change during the day. The performance of this attraction wasn't crap in the morning, and then good, and then dipped down at lunchtime, and then went back up. The problem is that throughput is a really crappy measure of performance. It's more a measure of demand. There's a really great ride called uh, Splash Mountain. When you ride Splash Mountain, you are almost guaranteed to get wet. On a hot, sunny day, you are more likely to ride Splash Mountain than on a cold, wet day. Which means, if you're counting people getting off the ride, those are all the people that chose to get on the ride in the first place. If demand is high, throughput will be high. If demand is low, throughput will be low. So just looking at how many people are coming through the system doesn't actually tell you much about the performance of that component. Except, possibly, in one case. And that's when it flatlines. When it flatlines, that means that this attraction is operating as quickly as it possibly can. It's processing as many customers as it possibly can through the system. The problem is, is that that may be false. That may not be true. Because 
there is some kind of maximum number. Like theoretically, we know. We can't just keep pushing people through an attraction as fast as we possibly can. The throughput is going to go up until it hits that number. But there's another case where it's going to flatline, which is just where you whoop, which is just where you have a constant amount of demand, and you're nowhere near your maximum. So just measuring throughput alone isn't enough to tell us where that maximum is. But that maximum is an important performance metric, because if we can increase the maximum, then in theory, we can meet more demand. So we need to be able to measure wh where that line is without trying to read it from throughput. Luckily, we can. So uh, I stood outside Goofy Sky School for a while. Goofy Sky School is a, um, a wild mouse roller coaster which means it's a roller coaster designed for very small cars with a very few number of people on it. So imagine a roller coaster with one car, with one seat on that car. So we can service one customer at a time. If it takes two minutes for that car to go all the way around the track, we can only service one customer for that two minutes, which means in a given hour, we can only have that thing go around the track 30 times. So we can only get 30 rides in an hour. Measuring the duration of the ride is actually quite easy. You just need the stopwatch that you had before. You just measure people getting on and off. Uh, and it turns out that this is actually really stable for theme park attractions. Right? You don't want one person getting on the ride to have a four minute ride and the next person getting on the ride to have a 25 second ride. Uh, you want everybody to have roughly the same experience. So those things are very carefully timed so that they all operate at approximately the same amount of time. You can scale that up. So if we want to uh, make that run with more customers, we need to uh, add more seats to the car that we've got. So we've got one car going around the track. We can add more seats to it. So imagine we've got the car going around 30 times in an hour, and we can put 20 customers on now instead of just one. So we add 19 more seats to the car. That means that we can now get 600 customers in an hour. We can process through this goofy Sky School attraction, which is cool, right? Like, this is how we scale these things up. And counting the number of customers that you can maximally kind of deal with is easy as well, because you just count the number of seats in the car. And that gives us a formula for calculating the maximum throughput, and it's based on fairly stable values. Right? The number of seats in a ride doesn't change, so the concurrency tends to stay around the same. The amount of time it takes to go around the track doesn't change, so that tends to stay the same as well, and the period that we're measuring is a constant. So maximum throughput is pretty much just a static line all of the time, and it doesn't often change. So we want to maximize that. We want to bring that number up. And in order to do that, by looking at the formula, we can figure out that there are two ways to doing it. We can either increase the amount of concurrency that we have. We can decrease the ride duration. Now, in a theme park, both of these are problematic. Right? Ride duration is problematic because it's actually linked to the business value that you're getting. So if a ride is two minutes, then that's cool. If a ride is three minutes, that's cooler, assuming it's a cool ride. It's a small world. It's way too long. Nobody should get on that ride. So you can't really minimize the duration too much because it's tied very tightly to the experience that you're trying to give. Concurrency is also problematic because there are a few different ways that you can increase concurrency. We can add more seats to a car. You can add more cars to a track. You can add another track. You can duplicate the entire attraction and put another copy next to it. Every one of those comes with an engineering cost at different levels. right? So a lot of time and energy goes into theme park attraction rides to make sure that these numbers are actually where they need to be before they construct anything. Now, it doesn't actually make sense to compare the duration of a ride between two different rides. Because Goofy Sky School is one experience, It's a Small World is another experience, and Space Mountain is yet a third experience. Each one of those, the duration of the ride, is linked to the experience that they're trying to give you. So it doesn't really make, you can't really say, well, this one's faster, therefore it's better. By the same token, the concurrency is also related to the experience as well. So we said in Goofy Sky School, we were going to scale it out to have 20 seats in a car. That actually doesn't work, because a wild mouse roller coaster is designed to be short, so it can make tight turns very quickly. That's the experience they're trying to give you. If you make it 20, 20 uh, people long, it can't make tight turns. That's an engineering fail. It will fall off the tracks. 
So, but what you can do is you can compare these numbers over time for a given attraction. So we can see, we can see, thank you. Um, you can see what happens if the ride duration goes up, so if it takes longer to go around the track, then throughput goes down because you can just fit fewer rides in the period that you're dealing with. And it's fairly continuous because duration is fairly continuous. So you can see in a ride that if the ride over time starts to degrade and slow down, that your maximum throughput will come down and you won't be able to meet the demand. Concurrency works the same way but, more, but in a discrete manner. This is an attraction where, say we started in January being able to service 20 customers at a time, and in February it drops down by one because one of the harnesses fails a safety inspection. Suddenly that's one customer per ride that you can't service anymore. So depending on how many rides you get in an hour, that number could go up pretty quickly, but it's still a discrete kind of drop. Okay, so, but what we really want, remember originally this was a, a case of we have a system running we want to be able to compare things to sort of see which ones are in trouble, which ones do we need to do performance shooting on. We can't really use throughput to compare rides because it's based on demand more than anything else. We can't really uh, use duration and concurrency because those things are linked tightly to the experience. You could use maximum throughput, um, but you would need to kind of set a maximum throughput target across the entire park and then tweak the concurrency and duration of everything to try and make it match. It's actually much easier to do another thing Another measure, one final one. We're going to measure a thing called saturation, which is how close to your maximum capacity you are. So when you're running, uh, if you're able to process 100 customers in an hour and you're currently processing 80 customers an hour, you're at 80% of saturation. And the idea would be that you would find, for each attraction, the amount of saturation that they were currently experiencing, and then look for the ones with the highest levels of saturation and optimize those. Now, you probably won't get to 1.0 saturation, and that's because maximum throughput is a theoretical value, and throughput is a measured value. Right? So chances are good due to like, slight overheads and inconsistencies. You'll never see exactly 1.0 saturation. So what you want to do is you want to define a threshold and say anything above, say, 75% saturation is worth noting and looking at, because that means that this attraction is very busy. And in order to compare attractions for saturation, what you want to do is measure throughout the day how often they're above that threshold. And the theory is you'd end up with a graph like this. We could look at this and we could say, Space Mountain spends seven out of the eight hours of the day that the park is open above the saturation threshold. So it's clearly very busy. And so I went around and I measured saturation for a bunch of things, and I didn't see this pattern at all. And I was confused. What I saw was nearly 100% saturation across the park. And I thought, clearly you could optimize some of that away. So <coughs> I did what I think anybody in this room would do when faced with a problem that you can't really kind of understand, you can't really grasp what's happening. I found Donald Duck. It's common in the industry to do rubber ducking. I highly recommend Donald ducking. So Donald uh, was very helpful, even though he didn't say anything, because they're not allowed to. And he kind of explained through me, because I was the one doing all the talking, what was going on. You see, when a theme park attraction runs at full saturation, what happens? That means that there is enough demand to fully run the thing, to run the attraction as, far, as fast as it possibly can go. And there may be some left over. And if there's some left over, it represents as people queuing waiting to get on. And in Disneyland, you are going to spend a lot of time in queues. You spend more time in queues than you spend on attractions, which is weird. Like, it's just a weird trade-off that people make willingly. Uh, and the theory is, is that it's worth standing around in line for a certain amount of time in order to get a cool experience at the other end. So why is it OK to run attractions at full saturation? Two reasons. One. Theme park attractions are really, really, really expensive. They're expensive to design, they're expensive to run, they're expensive to maintain, and they're maintained periodically, almost irrespective of how many people ride the thing, which means you want to get maximum usage out of that thing. People are coming into your park in order to, to have experiences. You want those experiences to be servicing as many customers as they possibly can. So if you have an attraction lying around with nobody wanting to ride it or with not enough people wanting to ride it, that represents waste, which sucks. We want to eliminate waste. 
Now, you can argue that standing in queue is also a waste. It's a waste of your time. But by that point, Disney already has your money. And like I said, people are willing to stand around in line. So, but it seems like the more popular rides are going to have longer queues. So, we can measure queue length. Right? How long is the queue? How long is the backlog of work for a specific theme park attraction? Queue length is interesting, not uh, based on its like, current value, but based on how it changes over time. Because if you measure queue length over the course of a day, and you look at the gradient, if queue length is going down, it's an indication that you're able to meet the demand for that attraction. That basically, you are processing more people uh, through the attraction than are joining the back of the queue that want to join. Conversely, if queue length is going up, that's a bad sign, because that means that more people want to ride this attraction than are ever going to be able to. In this specific case, by the end of the day, that is the point at which we are going to have the most number of customers left to serve. And at that point, what do we do? We still have to shut down the park at night time. So do we tell all those people to go home unsatisfied? Do we run the equipment and pay staff overtime? How do we handle this situation? Now, this is one that you need to be careful of, because an upward gradient in queue length doesn't necessarily mean that the attraction is unable to handle things. At 10 o'clock in the morning, 15 buses drop off tourists from the local hotels, and they all join the park at once. And when that happens, there is a steep spike in the number of people joining queues. But then it sort of tails off. So you do get spikes in traffic. And all you need to do is sort of zoom out further to be able to see whether or not you're uh, able to meet demand or not. But how do we handle this situation where we, we actually can't have people standing in the line at the end of the day? So we need to deal with that. What you want to do, ideally, is you find a time earlier in the day to close the input queue to actually say, please stop joining the queue. We won't be able to service you. You need to be really careful doing this, because you can do it really wrong in two very spectacularly different ways. If you go too early, you're going to run out of people to service before the park shuts, which means there's going to be a period of time at the end of the day during which your very, very, very expensive machinery is a very, very expensive paperweight. If you close the park too late, you're back to that original problem of saying, we, uh, we run out of time before we run out of uh, customers to process. So how do you pick that moment? How do you pick that moment where you say, this is the time when we want to close the gate? To do that, you need to measure something called queue wait time. Queue wait time is a measurement of how long can I expect to stand around in queue before I get to the front and get, uh, get on the ride. Uh, so luckily, we can measure this. It's actually really easy to measure. Take our trusty stopwatch. Don't go to Disneyland without a stopwatch. You need one. Join the back of the queue, start the stopwatch, and then wait, and walk to the front of the queue very slowly. And when you get to the end, you stop your stopwatch. That's an accurate measurement of queue wait time. The problem is, it's a measurement of how long it will take for you to get to the front of the queue. It's a measurement of the queue in front of you, which is now gone. The queue behind you is now a different queue. So actually measuring queue wait time doesn't help you at all. In fact, the longer the queue wait time is, the less useful it is to measure it this way. Because when you get to the end, more things have changed behind you in the queue. OK, well, that sucks. How do we deal with that? So rather than measuring it, we can estimate it. We already know how many people can go on the ride at the same time. We measured that in terms of concurrency. So we can basically walk backwards up the line, and we can measure how many rides there are in that line. We also know how long each ride takes. And we can measure that as well. So we can walk back up the line, and we can assign a finish time to each one of those rides through the queue. So then we can figure out, just by measuring how long the queue is, and by using the very stable metric of how long each ride is and how much concurrency we have, we can estimate how long queue wait time is just by <coughs> doing a quick calculation. Now, Disneyland absolutely does this. In fact, they go even further. So you can calculate queue length by counting heads. You can start at the front of the queue and just count heads going all the way back. But you can also kind of estimate how many people there are in the space by volume, which is a weird thing to do, but they do it which means you can start at the front of the queue, and you can walk back a certain number of distance. And you can say, that represents probably about 50 people. 
And you can walk a little bit more and go, that represents probably about 150 people. Because you can do that, you can hang these little signs along the queue that say, from here it's going to be 15 minutes. From here it's going to be 25 minutes. From here it's going to be 45 minutes. And those signs are hung through all the queues in Disneyland. Right, so we can calculate this fairly easily. There's a quick calculation for you. you just take the queue length, divide it up by our throughput. Uh, not just throughput, but maximum throughput, right? Because the only reason we have a queue is because we're running at full saturation, which means throughput is equal to max throughput. If it's not, you have a different problem. Okay, so we can calculate estimated queue wait time. <coughs> we want to try and minimize queue wait time. Right? People don't want to hang around in queues. It's boring. Um, they, they do all sorts of things in Disneyland to try and make it not boring. Those things are all lies. Standing around in a queue is boring. Nobody wants to do it. So we want to minimize that. So using the previous formula, we can come up with optimization techniques for trying to keep that queue wait time down. First of all, we can try and minimize queue length. But queue length is a measure of demand. You, can't, you can control demand, but not if you're performance tuning. That's a different problem. That's a marketing problem. You, can, uh, you don't really control queue length. In a theme park, the only control you have is to drop that gate down and say, please stop joining this queue. That sucks. We don't want to do that, because that represents turning customers away. But we do want to increase maximum max throughput. So we want to bring that max throughput line as high as we possibly can. And we already know how to do that. We do that by increasing concurrency and by bringing our ride duration down. But as we said before, bringing ride duration down decreases the value. So this is an interesting balancing act. Because the longer you're going to wait in the queue, the more value you want at the other end. So the longer the ride that you want to get at the other end. But decreasing the amount of the time on the ride will actually decrease the, the queue wait time. So the shorter rides are going to have shorter queue, queue waits, because you'll be able to get on the ride quicker. Now, you're going to give queue wait time as the responsiveness of a given attraction. So as you walk up through the park, you find a bunch of different attractions that you can potentially go on. And uh, each one is going to be a certain level of responsiveness. Something with a very long queue that's moving very slowly is very unresponsive. There is a long delay between when you decide to ride that attraction and when you actually get to the front of the queue and get to ride the attraction. Something with a very short queue that's moving very quickly is very responsive. Every time you decide you want to ride it, you get to. Like, it's almost instantaneous feedback. So you want to measure the estimated queue wait time across all the attractions in the park. And then you can measure those and compare them against one another. And doing that, you can find like which parts of the park are the least responsive parts. And you can try and optimize those. And as you bring the overall amount of responsiveness for individual attractions down, and you make them more, more and more responsive, Overall, the park gets more and more responsive. The more things you can do in a given hour, because you can kind of jump on more rides, more attractions, and do more things. And that gave me the ammunition that I felt that I needed. So I got back to enjoying Disneyland. And I kind of saw all the things, and then it was a very tiring week by this point. I was ready to go home. So I was trying to grow my beard out this week to try and recreate this glamorous look that I had. But I haven't been able to, unfortunately. But finally, back to work on Monday. And I got asked all the sort of standard questions when you go on holiday. What was your best, what was your favorite bit? Which, was, which ride was the best? Space Mountain is the best ride, by the way. Which, if you don't know, is a roller coaster inside a building with no lights on. So it's in the dark, <laughs> which is a fantastic experience. Feels a bit like being on a project. <laughs> but inevitably, I got called into my boss's office. How was it? Did you have fun? What did you learn about the performance of distributed systems? You know, it's like twinkle in the eye. And I think she was surprised because I went for the whiteboard again. And I said, all right, here is what we're going to do. We're going to measure. How long does it take to process each message? How many messages is each component processing at a time? In a given window of time, how many messages can we process? We're going to start to measure that stuff, and we're going to put it all in a database somewhere. We're going to use that. We're going to calculate the maximum throughput for each one of these components. And then we're going to use that to calculate saturation. And we're going to look for each one of our components, how close they are to saturation. How much of the time do they spend near saturation? 
And we found a few components that currently weren't slowing the system down, but they had the serious potential to start to very soon, because we were going to start to run into the problem of having components that had more work to do than they could possibly get through. The next thing we're going to measure is how long is the queue? How much of a backlog does each one of these components have? How much work do they have to do? And then we're going to use that to estimate how long it will take them to get through that backlog of work. Now remember, queue wait time is a good measure of responsiveness. So if I click a button in the UI and the email doesn't get sent for another 15 minutes, that's very unresponsive. That gives you that general feeling of the system being slow. So we were able to measure this as well, and we found some components that were already fully saturated where the queue wait time was already going up. And that's why the system was feeling unresponsive. And we were able to optimize those things and improve them and bring the queue wait time back down, get everything working again. Back to this diagram, we want to bring queue wait time down. But in a theme park, we didn't really have any gates on queue length. Remember, queue length is a measure of demand. So we couldn't really do anything other than saying, please stop joining this queue. Now, in a distributed system, you can't do that. You don't even have that gate. Because you can't say, please stop sending me processed credit card payments. I can't process them fast enough. Not only that, but you don't shut down the machinery at the end of the day. The machinery is more or less running 24-7, which means there's not a point that you have to reach where you've run out of work. But that leads to the problem of that ever-increasing so, uh, queue length, which means that you could have an ever-increasing queue wait time, which means your system could just get less and less responsive over time until it gets to the point where it feels like it's not functioning at all. So the only lever we have in a distributed system is to increase that max throughput for each one of the components. It's the only thing that we can do. Now, luckily, it's much cheaper to do this in the software world than it was in the theme park world. So we had uh, ride duration, like how long does it take to process each message, in a theme park is tied to the value proposition. Right? A long ride is cooler than a short ride in general. Except for it's a small world, it still sucks. So you can optimize this in the software, though, because sending an email is sending an email. That's the value proposition. It doesn't matter if it takes 30 seconds, two minutes, or like half a millisecond. So if you can optimize those things down, you want to. So you want to try and find cases where you can do that. Increasing the concurrency is also something that is much easier to do from a software perspective, because the engineering costs of duplicating things is not anywhere near as high. So there's a few different ways that you can increase concurrency. First and foremost, just scale the box up. Put more CPUs in it, right? More threads, and you can process more messages in parallel. And that's relatively cheap these days, especially in the cloud. You just bring up another instance and scale it up. Go crazy. Uh, if you're doing heavily I.O. bound work, you can go even further than that uh, because you can kind of process more things because you're not sort of bound to individual threads. So if you're doing proper async await in C Sharp, uh, talking to the queue is an I.O. operation. So if you're doing like any other kind of I.O., you can kind of pause while the other I.O. is doing stuff and be processing another message in parallel. So you can actually crank your level of concurrency and parallelism up even higher than the number of CPUs and threads that you have and still get a lot of benefit out of it. The next trick that you can do is just to copy the instance. Remember in a theme park, that sounded ridiculous, that you would take the attraction and build another copy right next to it was really expensive. In software, it's not expensive. It's an X copy operation. Just put another copy on another machine. And the cool thing is that they all share basically the same duration. The processing a message is still going to take the same amount of time. Sending an email is going to take the same amount of time, no matter how many processes you have doing it. But the amount of concurrency you get is actually summed across all of those things. So in this case, where we've got a component that can handle five messages concurrently, having three copies of it means now we can handle 15. You can scale this to ridiculous levels. And that's basically what AWS Lambda and Azure Functions is promising you. It's saying that you, they were going to keep your queue wait time very short by infinitely scaling and having so many concurrent instances running that every time a message comes in, it will be processed by a running instance of your thing without waiting. And that's fantastic, except when it doesn't work. And the reason it typically doesn't work is because you're connected to some other thing that doesn't scale infinitely. So I was working on a project where we had a uh, component that was processing messages as quickly as it possibly could. 
and it was flatlining. So we assumed that it had hit maximum concurrency, uh, maximum throughput. So we scaled it out, and the throughput went down. What was happening in the first case was that we were running into problems with um, deadlocks in the database. We were talking to the database, and it just so happened that all the messages coming in were for the same records, and we had optimistic concurrency on. So we had a whole bunch of messages being processed, but about half of them were just not being processed. They were throwing a concurrency exception, being rolled back into the queue, and being processed again. So although our throughput was flat, we actually weren't hitting anywhere near the max. And when we scaled it out, we just started getting deadlocks even faster than we were getting them before. Right? This is what is going to happen to you anytime that you have some kind of shared resource that's limited. So if you are trying to connect to a rate-limited API, scaling out to connect to it is just going to get you rate-limited even faster. Uh, so that's a case where actually reducing the amount of concurrency that you're, that you're doing will in, uh, result in increased throughput, which sounds weird. But it's also a warning sign, because that means you cannot scale any further than that. If you can't bring the performance of the thing down to run in a shorter duration, and you can't increase the concurrency, you have no levers left. That's as fast as you're going to be able to operate. So we did all this to our system. And over time, the uh, number of instances of people in the lunchrooms and complaining and sort of saying, well, it's sort of slow, went down, which is great. Uh, that's exactly what we wanted. So in exactly the same way that uh, people could trust that when the system stopped working, that the IT people were looking at it and were working on it, now when it was slow, they could rely on the fact that we were actually looking at it and working on it as well. So next Monday, you're all going to go back to work, I assume. I mean, maybe you won't. Ex actually, next Monday is a public holiday, right? <sighs> next Tuesday, when you all go back to work. You're probably going to have a conversation with some of your colleagues, with your boss, and you're going to get asked the standard questions. How was it? Did you enjoy it? What were the best bits? Someone might ask you the question, what did you learn about the performance of distributed systems? It's doubtful. But it might be, like, what did you learn? And it's going to be tempted to talk about ride durations and responsive roller coasters and scaling out theme park attractions. Resist that urge. Stop. Take a deep breath. Look them in the eye and say, in order to answer that question, you're going to need to send me to Disneyland. <laughs> it might work. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, has anybody got any questions? I'm still, I'm like 15 minutes early. Which is funny, because I cut 15 minutes out of the talk last night. <laughs> Seemed like you got to do it at the time. Yes? Uh, so it is still a monolith. Effectively, if, if any one of those components goes down, the whole, that whole unit goes down. So it's a question of whether or not the bringing a particular unit down brings down your entire application. Uh, and one of the things that I skipped over, because I'm a fool, um, was uh, when we actually got to the point of getting rid of our application server and only having those individual services, we were no longer coming in on the weekend to install new stuff. We were doing it at lunchtime, or doing it in the morning, or doing it whenever, because effectively you can take down the back half of the system, and the front half of the system doesn't notice, which is fantastic. That's what you want to get to. Anybody else? Thank you very much. <laughs>